Oh, yay, look at me, I'm live. Hopefully. All right, it'll pick up in just a second. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, let me start over here now that the camera is on. Yay for cameras. All right, when you are starting to DM a game, no matter what you do, and I've said this again time and time again, it doesn't matter if you're uh, running a pre-written game or if you are uh, doing a homebrew game, the very first golden rule number one, this is DM Alex's number one rule, never write the game before you know the party and the player types because you're going to write out this adventure for them. So if you don't know who's playing what, how can you write it for them? That's one of the uh, things. We've talked about player types before. Remember that um, there are two uh, schools of philosophy on this. So the first school says that there are audience members and then there are cast members, where audience members are people that are just happy to be here. They are sitting at the table. They're not going to get involved. And then you have your cast members. These are the people who want to be lime, you know, right in the center spotlight. They want their character to be heard and seen doing cool stuff. So know what kind of players you have. If you have five audience members and one cast member, then you're going to have to like find a way to uh, make sure the, the cast member is having a good time and that your audience members are engaged enough that they feel like they're part of this. The, the balance um, is what you're yeah. trying to strike. And it's going to be harder to reel in the non-cast yes. members. Yeah, the, the audience, audience members, because yeah. they're just happy to be here. They're the ones who are probably on their phones, which is, there's not a problem with that. They're the ones who aren't taking notes. You know, they're the ones that are just, it's a social setting, and they're happy to be here. Cool. But as a DM and... Eventually, as that cast member, there you guys are going to want to involve them because this is a, a you know a, a cooperative thing that we're doing. So make sure you know what kind of party you have as well. Meaning, like if you've got, for example, you know that if you're running Descent into Avernus, uh, about a third of the way through, it's been all humanoids. Who great, everything works on them. The rest of the adventure, yeah, it's demons, it's outsiders, and every single one of them have uh, advantage on all of their saves versus magic. So if you've got a party full of casters, you need to warn them way before they get to that point that, hey, your character that you're wanting to play, well, that's really cool, but you're going to have to overcome these obstacles. And you can do that by like putting in some sort of introductory encounters, you know, some little things that they, they face and go, oh, that was really tough because it had advantage on everything. And, you know, we're going to go to this plane where it's populated by these things. Yeah, okay, I better take something, you know, some change up my spell list so that I'm more buff instead of evocation. And uh, I might want to pick up a sword, you know, and figure out how to do some damage with that. Uh, but at the same time, if you are playing um, Wild Beyond the Witchlight, if you read Wild Beyond the Witchlight, you can play the entire campaign from page one to the final page without ever rolling a die for combat. There is a role play answer and rules governing the game so that the entire campaign is nothing but skill checks and role play. If you have a a party full of people who want to murder Hobo, mm -hmm. they are not going to have fun in that game. So that goes back to know the party before you run your game. So when in, when you're doing your homebrew, when you're doing session zero, because if you're going to do homebrew, you must, that is like asterisk, gold line, you must do session zero. Because that's where they're building their characters and you're kind of setting the expectation for what they're going to encounter. Uh, so tell them right then and there, hey, we're going to be doing a, this, this adventure that you're running on. It's going to be real light on magic items, but it's going to have a lot of opportunities for it. So if, you're, if it's going to be less on one thing, make sure there's a balance and there's more on another. Um, golden rule number two, keep secrets but not forever. So what that means is as the DM, you know everything that's going to happen, right? But I've just told you, never write the whole game out. 
So you need to be keeping track of during session zero what their character is as far as class and race and what their motivation is. So for example, if you've got a halfling that escaped slavery and now they hate all slavers, that is a real easy one to work with because you can just simply take that motivation and work it into the story somehow. So you can say like, okay, this first adventure is you guys going to, uh, you're, you're shutting down a slavery operation, right? Now the secret that you're keeping is this slavery operation was the original slavery operation that owned the halfling and they're a part of a bigger uh, sort of scenario syndicate kind of thing. So once they finish that first adventure, you reveal that little bit of knowledge, you know, hey, this was the original thing that you were a part of, uh, and that's going to give that one player that, aha, that tied directly to my character, that was really cool, and then you tie it into the bigger scenario so that they go, oh, I want to continue this, and when you, the bigger scenario, the whole thing needs to be made up of the motivations of your players. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. If you look at your worksheets there, um, so I've already listed out some information for you guys. All right, uh, this is just a real, like I said, this is a, a, a simplified version as I could come up with on how to keep a run an intriguing and successful adventure. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're doing session zero, you need to go ahead and tell them what the setting is. So uh, for example, are they playing in the Forgotten Realms? Because if they are, then they're probably going to want to visit some stuff that they're familiar with, or you're going to need as a DM to include things that uh, are in the Forgotten Realms that the people will like clue on, like Harpers and Zinterim and uh, you know the uh, uh, what is it, uh, Mithril Halls and uh, you know, Baldur's Gate, so that kind of stuff, so that they go, oh, cool, because you're trying to remember, trying to bring them into that world. If you're not playing in the Forgotten Realms or an established setting that everybody at the table knows, let's say you're playing in your own original setting, right? Then you need to kind of break it down with as much history, background that you can give them without like word vomiting. So that means like, uh, you know, you guys start off in this small town or you start off in the thriving city of, and this is the the main center of the, the, the continent that you're on, and it's been here for so many years, and it's enjoyed peace and prosperity, or it's enjoyed you know, you know, war and famine, and, and everybody here is mean and vicious or good and giving and generous. So you're setting up the setting without telling them the entire history of the continent, right? You're not telling them, you know, okay, so 15,000 years ago when the world first created, you're just giving them enough to get them started and then when you're telling them about this setting, you're doing this in session zero, so they're building their characters based on what you're telling them. So when they ask, okay, well, you know, uh, if I'm in this city, like in this world, you know, is there a jungle? Sure, absolutely. In fact, this city sits on the border between, you know, this massive jungle region, and it's untamed, and it's full of uh, strange creatures, or, you know, uh, it sits above a, a, a you know, a, you know, an endless pit that goes straight into the underworld where all these creatures are coming up and it's your job to kind of watch over to, you know, you're setting this up because they're trying to be a part of your story, right? So you've got to give them the information and let them sort of build around that. And then as they're playing, you have to continue to, to like, okay, and so you know this person because of this, or, you know, oh, you've been here before because this. And so they're like, oh, cool, all right, cool. And they're, what they're doing is they're, they're inserting, you know, their character into these settings, and it's building a story, it's building concern for your world. Um, so now, as you're, you're going in, um, I've got this kind of diagram right here, uh, and this is, uh, it's, it's the chain of events. Get it? It's a chain, right? Okay. So it starts off with your intro or your adventure hook. When you're doing your adventure hook, you tie it directly to a character or a character, you know, multiple characters' uh, motivation. Uh, if you look on your sheets, there is a space for that. Uh, it's going to be after, you know, you get your character, and then you've got their motivation, 
and when you're writing down, when you're filling in this worksheet, when it comes to motivation, 10 words or less. Just the very, you know, simplistic idea. You don't need the six pages that they wrote. You need the core uh, sort of uh, inspiration for why they're here. That way, it's easy for you to go back and reference. And that's all that is. It's for you to just be able to look at that and go, hates all slavers. Boom, moving on. You know, uh, loves gold, you know, wants to be the richest, richest person in the world. Very simple, short idea. Um, then you go into the adventure hook. So this is where you tie in, okay, this is this person's adventure hook. This is the intro. This is why they're here. And this is what's going to pull them into the adventure. And you're going to start with each session following that is a, is a link in the chain. So that means in each of these sessions, and you should do no more than 10 before you get to the conclusion of that adventure hook. So 10 sessions, and that, it, that concludes that adventure hook. That does not end the campaign, and I'll get to that in just a second. So each of these little links that you're, as you're going through, make sure you are meeting the requirements of your player types in every single link. If you've got somebody who wants to roll dice every single game and they want to do combat and all this kind of stuff, make sure in that session you've got that. If you uh, have puzzle solvers, if you have mad scientists, whatever you have, whatever type of player that you've got sitting at the table with you, uh, make sure that you have something for each person there so that when they leave your table, they should be happy and be excited to do the next session. And it's, and it's not just like, oh, cool, I'm playing D&D. &D. It's I care about what just happened, and I want to continue this. So by the 10th session, this is where you're going to conclude that first adventure hook. Uh, now, what that means is you're going to give a token, which is a clue or an answer to that original adventure hook. You're going to give the next hook, and that hook goes right back to the original formula, Pick your next character and put whatever, you know, it, whatever venture hook is for this person's motivation. Um, and then you reward your party. Because the problem is, if you're focused on one character's adventure and their motivation and everything, you've got everybody else at the table who's just kind of going along. So make sure that when you get to the end, everybody gets a reward. So that there's motivation to, oh, cool, let's do the next one because I got something from this and the next one might be about me. So when you do your reward, again, knowing your player types, knowing your party, make sure your rewards match what is important to each player. So again, if you have the rogue who wants to be the best thief in the world, have something to start them on that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a ring of invisibility, which is... Probably every rogue's like sought after most like this is the holy grail for them like paladins is the holy avenger you know there there's something there's that that one thing that they're hoping to get to lead them into that so if you've got someone who is like they want the they want to just be the biggest baddest ombre out there they want to be smashing face they want to you know uh to you know if you anyway everybody here who's seen box machina or watch critical role or anything you know if they want to be grog the goliath barbarian you know not very smart doesn't care about a whole lot other than like smashing face then make sure that when reward time comes you're not giving them a potion unless it's like Potion of regeneration makes you smash longer or, you know, something along those lines. And then as you uh, complete the adventure hook for that character, uh, make sure that you have a reward specifically for them. Um, give them some, hey, you did good, and here's that thing. You know, some it's, it's more than just getting an answer to their, their motivation because now... If they've solved that one, why do they want to continue? Well, because this was only a piece of the puzzle, and it turns out, you know, your suffering in your original tragedy was actually due to this thing up here, so you want to keep going, and this is going to give you the power to do so. So then you just repeat that process until you've gone through every character at your table. Now, each of these chain of events should be lengthening and tying into 
one great big overarching story. So it could in, it could have started off with the halfling, for example, we're going to use that again, was sold into slavery and escaped. The first adventure hook took you took the party back into the original slavers. They they put them down. They put them out of business. Whatever. Uh, and then they found out that the that slavery ring was a part of a bigger design. So that leads them to a city where, uh, you know, this is where the mage, you know, has some contacts. It turns out that those contacts uh, are uh, in on the syndicate, and they're trying to stop the party because, uh, you know, they are getting power or they're getting wealth or something along those lines, eventually leading to the final big guy, the final thing that you've been you know, foreshadowing from adventure hook number one, when you give that very first token where you give a clue uh, towards something bigger, they get to the big, bad, evil guy, BBEG. And, you know, it can be anything. It can be, you know, oh, well, it's been an abolith who's been using its psychic powers to control, you know, heads of these organizations towards its own sort of domination of the world. Okay, because everything should end in some sort of big climax. That's that's how we are kind of drawn into the story is, you know, as you, you get to realize, like, oh, it's a bigger problem, it's a bigger problem, it's a bigger problem, until finally it's a worldwide ender problem and our party is here to save the world or doom it if you're playing a negative one, uh, if you're playing an anti-hero, you know, something along those lines. So there you are. So you, you, you get to that point. And this is where we get to our very last line. Let players write the ending. The difference between a, uh, an adventure game and a story is that in a story, the ending has already been written by the person running the game. They're the ones that have already decided how this is going to play out. So no matter what, the players are eventually going to reach this end. That's not a game. That's a story. They're just here participating in your story. An adventure game is the ending is open, and it's the player's actions that are leading them to what they are deciding is going to be the, the, the ultimate conclusion. Um, we've talked about this in class before where uh, remember that I, I tell you guys, do not plan everything out and take notes about what your players are saying and thinking at the table. Because they might mention it as an offhand remark, and you go, oh, that's really good. And then you go back to keeping secrets, where you go, I'm going to put that here much later on and reveal it. Uh, and they're going to go, oh, remember when I said that? And they're going to get super excited. Because remember, the first rule is everybody needs to have fun. That includes the DM. Everybody needs to have fun at this table. If nobody's having fun, you failed as a DM. There's a way to fix it. You know, it takes open communication, it takes patience, it takes forgiveness, it takes all kinds of stuff where, you know, what was the main part of the problem? Was it unmet expectations? Did you not set expectations correctly in session zero? Which is usually where the, the, the fault lies. Uh, if you as a DM let characters die or fail and you don't try to rescue it in some way, then that's definitely a failure on your part. Now, if the players don't take that rescue when you offer it up, okay, that's, that's their choice. They don't have to take it, but you, you have to do your part to try to save whatever is going on. So, for example, um, had, a, had a party that they were on a boat in a river, and they had come up on another boat that was filled with goblins. Now, it was a goblin-made boat, so it's not the best quality. I give all kinds of context clues, like you can see that it's not, you know, all the wood doesn't match. Uh, they have smoke billowing out of the cracks in the deck and, and out of the sides of the ship. You don't even know how this thing is still afloat, right? So they pull up beside each other and they do what every player who has ever been on a ship wants to do. They want to board the other ship and fight the goblins on their ship. Okay, well, goblins are, you know, small creatures, uh, you know, not a whole lot of heaviness to them. Well, the half orc barbarian dives from the crow's nest of their ship onto the deck of the goblin ship and is like, okay, here's where realism comes in because I've told, I tell them all, you know, there are consequences to your actions. So it's like, all right, cool. We're going to see if the ship deck, you know, holds on to you. Uh, so 
I roll, and it's like, oh, no. So the deck just completely gives way underneath you, and you plummet into the ship. And it's like, okay, cool. That's the end of your turn. And I tell everybody else, this is what you see. And I explained it to them. And they're like, great. That's really cool. I'm going to fireball the ship. Yeah. I'm going to let that sink in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's okay. Of happening. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so they have their barbarian in the ship that they can't see. It's already coming apart, and then they fireball it. Yeah. All right. Barbarian's toast. Yeah, Barbarian, is, uh, Barbarian was absolutely dead. There was no saving that. But now I have to deal with the fact that, okay, now their ship is on fire next to their own ship, and what are the goblins going to do? Abandoned ship onto their ship. So, yeah, so they're bringing the fire with them onto the ship because goblins love fire. So you're like, oh, burn our ship, we'll burn your ship. End up with two ships on fire, one dead Barbarian because nobody can get to the Barbarian, and... You know, it just ended up dissolving, literally, into everybody dying and drowning. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. How could I have stopped this situation? <laughs> you know, uh, we talk about, uh, I like to set expectations. I, I make sure people know that there are consequences to actions. I try to keep realism because I love the immersion of it. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. And I had to think about it for a little while, and I had to go back, and I was like, okay, Actually, I should have known the Barbarian was going to do that because in like the third session, now this is, when this happened, this is like six months down the line. In the third session, they did something very similar where they dove off of a balcony into a fight that was happening below them. Of course I should have remembered that, and it should have been like, okay, that ship doesn't get close enough for you to jump on it. You know, they're, they're going to keep firing at range at you, and if you try to go closer, you know, I could have done that. Or... I could have just, you know, just said, okay, uh, you break through the first deck, but you're so big that you, like, get stuck in the hole that you create, so you're still halfway above deck. You know, you could still fight and defend yourself, but you're going to be doing it at disadvantage because you don't have the use of your legs. Could have done that. There's a lot of things I could have done. What could the players have done? Maybe not fireball the ship. Not, yeah, not yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, uh, we talk about this all the time. When it comes to uh, running adventures... It is so easy for the DM to kill a party. We control everything. It is no the challenge. easiest thing in the world. I don't even have to think about it. It is very difficult for me to not kill a party and or let them kill themselves due to their, you know, terrible actions, bad decisions, whatever, uh, because I'm trying to maintain realism, maintain the expectations that I've set, but at the same time, I don't want the game to end because they just don't get it. So I'm going to have to adjust, too. So it's like, all right, this is just going to keep happening. I need to realize that and just kind of take this stuff out. You know, don't let's just not worry about it anymore. We're not going to have that in there. So, all right. So if you're looking at your worksheets here, all right, at the very top there, again, you've got your setting, right? So you're going to write in what your setting is. So if you're setting in the Forgotten Realms, cool. Set it in the Forgotten Realms. If it's a specific place in that setting, like if you're setting is a city within a realm or within something, you know, your own home group creation, write all that information in. Because that's just easy when you come down to your session zero. Okay, you guys are going to be starting in the city of blah, or you're starting in the realm of blah. You just fill in the blank there. But the next, again, you're going to go through and you're going to take up your uh, character uh, race, their class, uh, their name, and then on the next session, next section there, you're going to write in each of their motivations in 10 words or less. So this requires you communicating and talking to your players during session zero of, you know, okay, well, why are you? You know, why are you a uh, uh, Aarakocra uh, um, barbarian? That's a good one. Okay, so why are you that? Oh, well, because of blah, 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 blah. Cool. What I heard was, you know, I'm tribal or... Uh, I have this inner rage in me, and I don't know where it comes from, whatever. Whatever they say, condense it down to 10 words or less and put that in that blank so that you can go back and refer to it and use this as a checklist so that as you complete their motivation, check. That's, a, that's like a, you know, a little thing that goes, okay, I did good, and then move on to the next person. Then after that, you're going to make sure that you tie in your adventure hook using your uh, chain of events here. Start with your adventure hook. How many sessions it's going to take? No more than 10. By the 10th, you've conclu concluded that adventure hook. 
I know 10 sounds like a small amount of time, right? 10 sessions. If you're playing weekly, that's 10 weeks. That's over two months of playing. It's two and a half months. That's a long time for a single adventure hook. Uh, if you're playing uh, every other week, that's five months of time. That's a long time. Uh, so make sure your sessions you know, are, are meeting everybody's expectations and you're keeping them within that, that sort of time frame that you guys are running and make sure by 10 you're done. Anything more than 10 and you're going to have players that start losing interest because this last two months has been all about this one character and I'm done with it. If you can get it done in less than 10, all the better. Uh, I don't really have a minimum. Like if you could do it in one session, great, cool. Good on you. I normally can't because I'm long-winded and I like to continue stuff out, sometimes a little too long. Uh, so, like, at, m at my minimum, I think within five sessions, so just about five weeks. Uh, and I, considering in that five weeks, uh, we're probably not going to meet at one point. So it's actually going to be more like six weeks of time. Uh, or we may have to end early or something like that. Just keep that in mind. So, again, if you're looking at ten sessions and you've got, you know, oh, we didn't play this week and all kinds of stuff, you're suddenly stretching out into longer and longer periods of time. Um, uh, so yeah, so there you go. So that's, that is my chain of events. That's kind of my help with the homebrew here. I've done enough talking. I want to turn it over to you guys now. Okay. Uh, who here is actually running a homebrew or thinking about running a homebrew or, or is about to run a homebrew? Anybody? It's a mix between homebrew and pre-made. Okay, cool, <laughs> cool, cool, cool. All right. So let's, um, let's start there. All right. So tell me first off, um, what's your, uh, What's your pre-made beginning with? Your pre-made? Uh, it's from this, uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard of this uh, subscription-based thing called Dungeon in a Box. They do a lot mm -hmm. of cool things. Heard of it. Yeah. They send you, you get maps, you get these really cool, like, acrylic menus. It's like a loot crate kind of thing, Kind right? of, yeah. yeah. And the adventures are made to be written where they can be done as a one-shot, but they do have an over-connecting story called Voyage of the Fallen Star. Cool. There where you go. it's like this comet had, like, landed and stuff, and then... The player motivation is whoever finds the fallen star gets one wish, gets a wish granted to them. Okay, neat. So, so the motivation. And pause then, right there, real quick. Okay, let's identify real quick because I've just been talking about this, right? So, what's the uh, what's the conclusion to this? He just said it. Getting a star. That's right. And what what's that going to get them? Uh, the they get a wish, right? Okay, so that right there, the wish is powerful enough that everybody in the party is going to want that wish. No matter what their motivation was, it fits in with that. Wish is the probably easiest thing to tie to somebody's motivation, you know. All right. And so then uh, there you said it comes in like pieces and parts and like you get like uh, different sections of it at a time and it can be different stuff each time because it's kind of like, yeah, it all has a cutting kind of story. The one, uh, the year that I subscribed to it, that was just the story they're doing. They're mm -hmm. actually about to do another story, but I kind of canceled my subscription because I was going mean, to get 12 boxes of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Space. But, uh, yeah, and it is, um, I'm running it for my stepdaughter and her friends, and I gave them options about what they wanted. I'm like, we can do a pirate theme, I have a sci-fi stuff, and I have a grimdark campaign I really want to run, too. And then they chose pirate, and then that's kind of what it is. It's very pirate theme. But the beginning of it isn't very pirate, so I'm kind of home brewing the intro section. So there we go. So, <laughs> so I'm changing so, it, and I want to get them to where the module starts. All right, so in session zero, you're setting the, the expectations right away. Mm -hmm. um, so you tell them that, hey, this is going to be a pirate-themed adventure, because that's what you guys want to do, which that right there fits a whole lot of stuff we've already talked about on the board there. Uh, you know, you're listening to your players. So they're building their characters around this idea of they are pirates. Mm -hmm. Now you've got this this sort of, uh, well, you have this predefined setting that they're going to be moving into. Now is this going to be like a traditional open water pirate theme, or is it like Spelljammer through the Astral Sea kind of pirate theme? It's a theme? traditional pirate open water. Cool. So you want to make sure that in your session zero, you're telling them that, hey, mm -hmm. this is going to be ships and you're going to have water. So make sure that if you're playing a character that wears heavy armor, that they have a way to deal with the idea of being in the water by themselves. Yeah. 
So, you know, it might be one of those things where they go, okay, if there's ever a fight, I have to be tied to something on the ship. Uh, the cool thing is you now know, hey, there's a there's that little weakness there that I'm going to put that character in peril and the rest of the party needs to figure out a way to save them or that character needs a way to save them. Shipwreck happens, you know, and now everybody's been tossed into the ocean. You know, how does this you know, character survive and you should give them a little bit of, uh, a, you know, a little help there. Like you, you know, you, you sputter to the surface and you've grabbed a hold of some debris and that's the only thing keeping you afloat right now. Now what? And then turn it over to them. Let them tell you how it goes and let the party get in there too. Cause they're going to be the ones who want to talk about this and how to fix it. Um, Oh, we got some people commenting. Hi guys. That's Christopher Hood and Scott, Scott, this sounds really complicated. It is. That's one of the reasons we have the class is because we're trying to help people understand it a little bit better um, and uh, try to try to actually use this knowledge to improve their own games and, and build on their own skills. Okay, cool. So now you've got the predefined. You have your setting. You have done session zero, so they know what the expectations are. They know what the setting is. You know what their motivations are at this point, right? But you do have this predefined thing. So as we're getting to the final wish, the final reward that they're going towards, how do you plan on tying that to each of those characters? Well, I asked them for them to like come up with a wish, and they have yet to tell me their wish. They're kind of split right now. Cool. So, and I actually kind of told my stepdaughter, she's kind of like, it's her and her group of friends, so she's the one coming in. And I told them, I'm like, well, it's okay for you guys not to be able to agree on a wish because that can make some par good party dynamics because realistically a group of four travelers, while they may have the same goal in mind, get the following star, they may not all agree. Mm -hmm. right. So I'm thinking I won't know the wish until if they find the following star and get to it, I'll be just as surprised as they are. Okay, <laughs> so, cool. Because the one, they also, when they made their characters, for some reason, they decided to curse themselves, and I don't know why. I didn't tell them to do it, but they did it. Hey, that's, <laughs> that's cool. Interesting. Yeah, so, uh, so all heroes so are born from tragedy. One of them was thinking that we should wish to get rid of our curses, and then some of them are playing as monster characters, like one is a Medusa, one is a full-on orc, and I did tell them, you know, if you play as monsters, people aren't going to necessarily be as kind to you. So the one is thinking, well, we could wish to end, like, the monster racism. <laughs> so that's oh, why they're Oh, genocide. Split. Yeah, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. One wants to end racism, one wants to end their curses. So that's where we're at right now. Okay. I, have, I have kind of done the session zero with them already. Like, they got their characters created. I went through their sheets to try and be like, I had to go over and fix a few things. Mm -hmm. Have you come up with but, uh, <clears throat> your starting point where everybody's going to gather? Oh, yes. Awesome, awesome. I'm gather on a big ship. I'm okay, cool. excellent. I bought that big boat mini that was sold here. I'm yeah, done all right. <laughs> so. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's actually a really good topic. Um, we can talk about real quick. So how do you in your homebrew world? How do you plan on creating uh, the immersion factor? You know, how do you bring them into the realm uh, other than just theater of the mind? Like, what do you, what kind of stuff do you guys plan on doing? Uh, I'm a huge mini person in battle maps um if i i know somebody a, like that if i was a rich man i'd get like the 3d terrain <laughs> like, i love all that stuff but but yeah so you that's, you. that's yeah. how i've always done it what little i've ran so far <laughs> that's cool and anytime we have stuff like that we we use it because uh that's just a it's a it's a tool for immersion but it's also fun for the players mm -hmm. to be able to actually play you know yep. play with the the, the mm -hmm. mini and the D, D stuff yeah because <clears throat> when i first started playing D, &D i was a child mm -hmm. and somebody would say okay you're in a 20 by 20 foot room i'm a child <laughs> <laughs> so this thing is as big as a football field in my head right mm -hmm. but you show somebody what a 20 by 20 room really looks like Figures and minis and everything that's in there. Like, oh, okay, I get it now. Mm -hmm. But you don't need any of that if you yeah. don't want it. It can be all in the mind. It could be all on a simple piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Or you could go as elaborate as you want. I'm curious to know, since you've got the ship, and that's your starting point, mm -hmm. right? What, and, and when I build my homebrew worlds, I imagine my first hex. Okay, what's in my first hex? Well, it's the meeting point. It's the town. It's the boat. Then, what are the hexes, the six hexes around it? That's good. Right? 
Because that way, your players are going to be like, well, we're at this hex, we do this, and then we go this way. So then you already know what's there. Now, you don't have to uh, draw the whole world out. Don't do that. You will drive yourself insane. <laughs> See the board. You want to you wanna build the world with your players. <laughs> so you're going to have a general outline, but you want to build the world with your players as you go along. That will help you out immensely, and you'll have more fun. Uh, and they will have more fun. Yeah. And some concrete things that you'll need in your homebrew, though, right? For Especially for a game like Dungeons & Dragons or similar games where there's classes with jobs, is uh, if there's going to be clerics or healers that get their divine power from a deity, you're going to want to know what deities are available in your world. You yeah. can use preconceived ones that we've already come up with as humanity, or you can come up with your own. It doesn't really matter. Just make sure you get yourself a list of them so that anybody who plays a cleric or wants to bring religion into the game can do that. Uh, and then going back to uh, mapping your campaign. You're starting off on your boat, for example. What's the name of the uh, body of water that it's in? Uh, the start in the Forgotten Realms, the Sword Coast Sea. The, okay. You're literally leaving the port of Baldur's Gate. Okay, going. excellent. That water. And then they'll be going to a portal that leads them to the Green World, which is where the module takes place. So it's kind of a multi-world thing. Excellent. So, yeah, so, you, so you, if you're using a little bit of a... A preconceived campaign setting. You don't have to use everything. It's yeah, almost yeah. impossible. Uh, unless you become a scholar of the Forgotten <laughs> Realms or something like that. Uh, it, you're just going to want to know bits and pieces of it. Mm -hmm. And just build it from there. But remember, you're, you're, you're only on a spot this big on the map, right? Mm -hmm. So all you need to know for that campaign is that spot on the map. Mm -hmm. For that day, I mean. For that session. For that session. You just need to know what's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to if you're creating your own pantheon, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to tie this in with if you're creating your own world, every time you mention something specifically, like deity name, domain, uh, body of water name, write it down. Because what you'll find is as you start adding this information, you may want to keep using this world. This isn't you know, a one-time use for this adventure. So if you already have all this stuff established, when you play again with new characters and a new adventure, uh, you already have a lot of this information. So you can just say in session zero, okay, here's the list of gods, okay? Here's some places of interest that you might have in your backstories, go. And if you're playing with players that played in the first game or in the fifth game or whatever, however many times they played in this world, they are going to look at all of that and go, cool, this is what I'm going to do, and they're already going to know. And then somebody else who might be brand new to your world will be like, oh, okay, well, this is a little overwhelming. It's a lot of information. And you go right back to that first time you ever played in the world, and you go, okay, tell me about your character. You know, just what kind of character they are and why they are. And then you go, cool, you might be interested in this and this. But most of the time, once they start talking at session zero, your other players are going to go, oh, well, you should be from here because of A, B, and C, and they're going to be really excited about it. That's going to get this person really excited about it. Or they might be like, well, I don't know. I don't really like that either. Like, Then you have to kind of, as DM, create something new, write that down, because <laughs> it's going to probably come up. Mm -hmm. um, then we get back into you know tying that into their motivations and stuff. Yeah. Um, all right. So then we get to the final thing, which is uh, we know that the very final thing that happens is they get a wish, right? Uh, but along the way, what kind of treasure is going to be available to them? This is a pirate thing, so there's got to be booty. Oh, yeah, there's definitely going to be treasure. There's The module's actually pretty good at giving you magic items. Even in the very first dungeon, there's like this really cool cloak. I just <laughs> read it, but I already forgot it right now. <laughs> but... Uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of stuff along the way. And then the cool thing about it is they, they'll end up getting this thing called the Astral Compass. And the module actually gives you a compass thing. And then in each cool. box, you even get stickers. So as they complete each book, like I said, the module comes in like little tiny books. It's very easy to run. So as they complete each one, they find a piece of the compass and that adds to it. And then when the compass is complete, it points them in the direction of the thing. All right, awesome. Neat. And That's then awesome. it looks like that is really final really cool module. It looks like you actually do go to the astral plane, and then they have to encounter this like angel looking thing. Oh no, the mini's really cool. It's about the tall. Nice. Awesome. Excited to use it. 
Well, yeah. and if you uh, finish that, right, so the, you've gone all the way through, they've got the wish and everything, and now it's new new party members, new adventure, uh, how do you tie it in to what's already happened? Ooh, I don't know. Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. And you shouldn't, because I've already told you, don't write the ending out. Let the, pl the players decide, okay, and this is how it's going to affect it. At the end of the game, when they've got their wish, then go, okay, your wish comes true, you know, but what are the consequences to it? And let them just uh -huh. fill it in. Had a thought, but it depends on what level they are. Mm -hmm. The campaign should actually run them to level 20, so they should Ooh, be pretty strong. But wow. I'm talking yeah. about here. And I'm thinking, because pirate water, what better way to end that than to have them have an encounter Cthulhu? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no thanks. Unless no, 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 Mm -hmm. But she does get bored during Curse of Strike because that can be somewhat combat heavy. Because <laughs> zombies, a lot of zombies, a lot yeah. of creatures that they can't really talk to. And I'm like, I'm sorry. But when they do encounter humans, I try and give her role play sessions to like get her fun in. So on, on that situation for everybody, if you do have somebody who likes to role play all the time, all the time, mm -hmm. uh, when they roll her to hit, and it, it's going to hit, you say, okay, it's a hit. But what, what do you do? How do you yes. do it? And let them role play it. Mm -hmm. and it try to get get them some satisfaction out of that. Yeah, some people just want the straight math, and the, you know, yeah, the they're the min maxers, and the number crunchers, some other people want to uh, do, yeah, do the, the role play. The rest so you, you want to try to let them do that. They just want to kill things. Like that's all they want. They just want to fight, and they want to get out of Barovia. Like, yeah. But she wants to talk to everything and interact, which is fine. Yeah. 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 Uh, have uh, you thought about uh, like doing not at table sort of like role play? kind of thing where like uh, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Discord so like if I've got somebody who you know they're they're a big role player but I've only got four hours and I've got to fit you know all these things in so that I can make sure all of my players are happy uh, I'll be like okay cool we're gonna do that on Discord and I'll throw out some like you know I'll start off with an NPC and stuff you know what's really good about that it's all documented, so I don't have to remember it. I just go back and reread it be like, what did I say then? You know, and scroll back through. Uh, that's a that's a really good way to do it. Uh, or you can do like, okay, cool. Um, let's do like a, just a kind of a side thing between now and next session where we talk about that and you can play it out that way. Like, uh, if you consider doing any of that kind of stuff. Uh, that's not cross my mind. That's a good idea. So. Oh, thanks. Thanks. I'm sitting so at the front you, of the table for some reason or another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And getting the player type, like I said, the other players are new. I don't know the player types. Um, cool. My boyfriend is in it. He seems like he's very interested in lore and story. He even said, like, if my character ends up dying, can I have it for my character built of Warforge? And I'm like, he's very much about connecting everything. So I'm right. like, okay, so now I really have to amp up the story for him. The Mad other two, I have no idea what their types are. So. That's great. So we'll as you're playing, you're going to have to pay attention to what makes them yeah, pay attention it. and more excited. Um, and you'll have to adjust on the fly, which we talk about that. That's where your improv skills have to be on point. Uh, because if you've got somebody who suddenly perks up at a, at a riddle, and you're like, uh, this wasn't that big of a thing. <laughs> now you're like going back and going, all right, now there's a riddle here and a riddle here. <laughs> you know, you have to make sure that every time there's something for them to figure out and solve. Uh, if you've got somebody who is already thinking about their next character. <laughs> the, the only way I've found, and this is just me, and it may or may not work for you, but what I found is with those kind of people, uh, I usually end up having them become either uh, they have many followers so they can build that character and that follower will join them when they need it. You know, like, oh, well, actually what I'll do is I'll reach out to my contact, uh, Billy Bob, because Billy Bob is the best healer in the, that I know, and I'm going to bring him along this time. Or, you know, I'm going to reach out to Phaedra, and Phaedra is a druid who speaks with animals, and we're going to have that available to us. So you can do it that way, or you can have them as a member of a, uh, like a guild or something that gets assigned to the party. And that way it's like, okay, cool. Uh, you are done with this, so we're going to put you back, and we're sending somebody to take your place. 
and they can bring in another character right there. And the party is going to go ahead and accept it because if you establish at session zero that, okay, cool, this person is a member of a guild that has been assigned to your party. They are assigned to observe or they are assigned to help you out and make sure you succeed. Uh, but, you know, this person may or may not be here the whole time and they may get replaced. Then it becomes normal when it's like, okay, cool. Thanks, guys. That was fun. Glad we survived. Cool on the treasure. We're going to take this information or we're going to take this back to the guild and uh, we'll send somebody out to join you for the next part. Might be me again, you know. Um, and eventually they will get to that point where it's like, oh, cool. Who do we got this time? You know, and oh, cool. We remember you. We did this. Really like, or somebody brand new that they've come up with. They're like, what are you all about? You know, and like, oh, I'm a necromancer. And the paladin's like, you're a what? <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, cool. There's the dynamic there, but they we can't really. Best friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. I think you're going to live in my hip pocket, you know. <laughs> so that's how I would handle that is if you've got somebody who's already looking at other character builds, you know, they're interested, maybe not in the whole story just in the story of each character and what they can do, they're going to get bored with that character probably within three sessions and are going to want to swap out. And they're going to want to do something else. Again, your job is to make sure that everybody's having fun. Just have it built in already that this is how that thing happens. And then you might have other players at the table who are going, well, I'm kind of, I kind of realize that after six levels that my monk is not doing nearly as good as I thought it was going to. And then you just have that character who's a member of the guild or who has followers and stuff and go to them and be like, hey, cool. Uh, how would you like to be my follower? They'd be like, yeah, that'd be great. Cool. And then they hand them a character sheet. You know, okay, cool. You're now this person. Or it can be, if they're a member of a guild, they can be like, oh, cool. Well, let me put you in touch with the guild. We'll get you sent off to, you know, to get trained and all that kind of stuff. And we'll send somebody in your place. And then they bring in a new character that they want to try out or want to play instead. Uh, that mechanic works uh, pretty well. Uh, again, it gets a little muddled when you get towards the end game and you've got a brand new character coming in and you're, they're like, you know, you've got the rest of the party who's been there the whole time and they're going, do you know what we've been through? And they'd be like, yeah, absolutely. I know what you've been through. We've got it documented. That's why I'm here for this last little bit. And like, that's why I care about this. Uh, you know, you you, you kind of have to force that a little bit. You know, to be like, all right, this is the only way this is going to work. Uh, yeah, so that's that's how I would handle all of that. Um, all right, uh, any any questions about starting homebrew or any questions about homebrewing in general that I haven't already touched on? Good silence. Crickets. Crickets are good. That means I've usually covered everything. Uh, well, as always. I'm here all the time, so if you guys do have questions or you want me to look at some stuff, you know, uh, we'll do that at the end of class where I'll get a chance to actually look at anything that you've already got that you're kind of wondering, like, how do I run this or is this balanced or what do I do about this? I can do that. Or any other time when I'm here, if you guys, as long as I don't have a customer in front of me, you want to talk about this stuff, you want to, you want some help with it, feel free to do so. Reach out to me on all the socials, reach out to me on Discord, whatever you're most comfortable with. Uh, and if I don't respond right away, don't get mad because I've got the whole life thing going on. But I will eventually see it and go, I will, let me get to that right now, you know, and I'll, I'll respond. Uh, if it's something that's urgent, call me or come see me. <laughs> you know, if you've got a session that day and you still haven't figured out what you're going to do, you got to call me or come find me. <laughs> I'll be like, all right, cool. Tell me the problem. And we'll go from there. Uh, keep those worksheets, uh, make copies of them, use them because yeah. that's going to be a big help when you start doing your own homebrew stuff. Uh, it, it's got all the information to get you through the first chain of events and you can just duplicate it for the next chain of events. And remember what I said about keeping notes, everything that they, the players come up with, just jot a little note down. Maybe you'll use it. Maybe you won't. But if they come up with it, try to work it in, you know, because this isn't a movie, this isn't a story, this is a game, and they're participating in creating it alongside you. All right. Did I miss anything? All of you, for, for notes, all of you may not be able to take good notes and DM at the same time, but with modern technology, you can just record the session. Just record yourself, like if the players are not comfortable with you recording them. Just record yourself. And then you can play that in the background on your headset or whatever and refresh yourself. 
mm -hmm. and just keep expanding from there. Yeah, that's so a, just one idea since we've got the modern technology. Yeah, don't be afraid to use the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I try not to memorize anything, but I have everything available to me that I can get to within about 30 seconds. Um, I've used, uh, I've, I've talked about uh, using some tools on here. I'm going to see if I can, for our people that are watching, I think I can share my screen. Um, let's see here. Cause I want to share, I want to show you guys too. Let's see, interjectivity. All right, I don't see it right off the bat, so I'm not going to worry about it right this moment. Oh, that'll be for another day, I think. Um, okay, so I was, I'm going to show them one of the tools that I use. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So for those of you who are watching online, sorry, you don't get to see this. I'll figure out a way to get it. I'll put a link in right about here so you guys can use it there. Um, and this is, uh, where is my, uh, that's the round table. Okay. Somewhere in here. Yeah, there it is. Initiative tracker. We're going to use that as a new tab, please. All right. I'm going to post it up here so you guys can see. Um, mm, 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 cast that. All right, cool. So this website is called dm.tool slash tracker. Um, I use this for my initiative for, it, it's super easy, like, uh, player A, player B, goblin, Goblin, um, player C, right? Okay, everybody rolls initiative. Cool. So when I start typing in a monster that already exists out there, it puts in all I need to know about that monster. I don't need to have the, the cards handy. I don't need to pull up a thing. It's got it right there. Um, so if I need to, I can go uh, right here where you see the little link button. And it takes me to the card, right? Pretty neat. It's a very handy thing. It keeps encounters moving. Um, but I've got all this in here. I'm going to hit the sort button, and it puts it in order for me. So I don't have to do anything. I just set up a whole encounter, and it took me how long? Right? And I have access to the information I need. I've got the HP tracker right here. I can put in. They just took three damage. Right? Easy free available to you. This is another one of those topics we talk about using um, using the technology that's out there. I want to drop this, like I said, to our people watching at home. Here is the link for that. Um, it's, it, it's so handy and I use it all the time. Um, you can use, if you're on D&D Beyond, for those of you who kept your subscriptions, um, we're, we, we are not going to talk about the OGL. <laughs> That has been settled, Fine. sort of. Yeah. In case you didn't know, they're going after Roll20 now, saying that they're a video game. Yeah, anyways, moving on. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, if you're using D&D Beyond, D&D Beyond has that function in there for you as well, where you can create your initiative tables. It's got the monsters available to you as well. Um, as you saw, when I clicked on the link, it took us to D&D Beyond and showed us that you know thing there. But um, you've got one. Well, it also allows you to create your own homebrew and track everything. So, like, the name of your starting point, cities, towns, NPCs, whatever. Uh, as long as you have the account, I honestly don't know if this is available to free accounts. I have no idea if it's available to free accounts. Uh, mm -hmm. But it allows you to track just about everything on there. And what's it called? It's just uh, D&D Beyond homebrew, homebrew Creations under Collections. Cool. All right, everybody at home, you got that? So it's D&D Beyond Homebrew Creations under Collections tab. So you can go in there and set up whatever it is from monsters to places of interest to pretty whole, much everything. The whole nine yards. Everything. So the whole nine yards. So, yeah. And, again, when we talk about, you know, make notes, keep track of that kind of stuff because you may come back to it. There's a handy way of keeping track right there. Uh, all right. Uh, what else? What else can we talk about now? So we've talked about kind of the how to run it and stuff like that, and you guys didn't have any questions, which, you know, I'm going to have to vamp now for 45 minutes. Or, <laughs> no, but, um, like, one of the things I talked about when we were, we were talking about immersion, 
right? I'm kind of circle back to that now. We talk about using minis and stuff. I'm a big fan of technology, uh, as you can probably tell, because I use it a lot. Um, have a playlist. If you're doing pirates, uh, sea shanties, man, sea shanties, right? Uh, you know, if there's, uh, if you're doing, you know, uh, any sort of like heavy combat thing, there's there are playlists, free playlists out there that you can have in the background that are just instrumentals for stuff like that. Uh, I like to do uh, if, if I have access, if I'm playing here at the store. Um, I've got the TV that I can cast to, and I'm constantly throwing stuff up there. So, like, if it's a monster that I don't have a mini for, you know, okay, and this is what you see, you know, and it's like I have a placeholder on the map for them to use for as far as the, like, the the tactics go. But imagination, I take it all, you know, it's right there. They can see this is what you see. You know, um, I like to do that kind of stuff. If it's a spooky sort of like, you know, you you come upon a cabin in the woods, nice little trope, throw up a picture of a cabin on the woods, have printouts for that kind of stuff. Uh, I say it's a digital age. This is easy enough to put on a tablet and go, and you, bam, see yeah, this. You're you making know? it really easy for you. Yeah. Uh, if you're on Discord, I drop pictures and stuff directly into our Discord chat so that if I don't, because that's one of the times like when I'm not here and I don't have the TV available to me. Um, yeah, everybody's on the Discord, so I'm just like, okay, and then this shows up, and everybody's like, holy crap, you know, they're like, oh, wow, whatever, but it's all right there, and then I don't have to remember what they ran into, because it's documented, <laughs> you know, it's right there, so, uh, and then, yeah, then they can be putting stuff in, too, like, you know, okay, this is what my character looks like, you know, drop a face claim on there, uh, whatever, so I use the tech, it's there for a good reason. Um, for music, I like to use uh, Lear RPG Music. He has gone in and created many playlists for different subjects. That is L Y R E. Yeah, Lyre. Yeah, Lear. Lyre RPG, RPG music. music. And, you know, he's got stuff on there um, that you can just generally use, but he's also starting to make custom soundtracks for modules. He's got Fandelver on there, yeah. and he is right now in the middle of working on Stormwreck Isle. And then uh, he has said, uh, as long as the Patreons keep coming in, he'll keep doing every book, making soundtracks for every single one. Yeah. And uh, he's got like the general ones that he has, is, like Leaving the War, Battle Music, Unholy Army, Fallen Hero, Faith Forest. Uh, magical clearing. This is just like general kind of stuff that you can just throw up on the Bluetooth speaker that's playing on low just for ambience. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of ambience, I really love describing uh, smells. Yeah. I love describing, uh, try to make it feel like if it's claustrophobic. Uh, I love to describe, especially the weather. Uh, I, I personally try to stick to the weather outside. Because most, most everybody just came in from it, and they know what it feels like that day. So <laughs> it's much easier for their brain to just snap to it. It's a stormy day on the deck of the ship as it, you know, is yep. creaking in its moorings here at Baldur's Gate Port. Like, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, like, they, they don't even have to really imagine all that much. They go, cool, and they're in the story. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a desert... And you want to be, you know, as immersive as possible, just reach over and turn the AC up and start increasing <laughs> the heat. <laughs> it's really hot in here, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's what your characters are feeling. <laughs> um, so then, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, all right, it's now after six, and I don't want to take any more of your time up talking about this homebrew stuff. Uh, if you guys want to move on, we'll move on. I want to turn it over to you because this is not a lecture. Uh, I want you guys to be able to participate and, and ask questions like we've been doing, but you know, there's there's a lot of us here, so I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk and ask. And you're sitting in a room full of people who are either on the same experience level as you or have at least been where you're at right now, and we want to help you because mm -hmm. we want you to be DMs. We want you to continue promoting our favorite hobby. Yeah. Well, at least it's my favorite. Yeah, I'm not to speak for you, but... I'm invested in you. Yeah. I mean, I want you to succeed. I want you to guys to have a table full of players, if not 
tables full, tables players. full of players. People should be lining so, up to get into your DMs. <laughs> whatever questions you may have, I'm available, he's available. Just bring them anytime. Doesn't have to be right now, but if you got some right now, that's what we're here for. Otherwise, contact us anytime. Yeah, I absolutely. All right. Anybody got anything? I, I do have a question. Awesome. Ghost, so yes, thank you. So, just is, this isn't necessarily about home brewing, but just in general. True, sure, true. Sure. Things like, um, what, what do you guys think is like the best way to kind of track, like, you know, like how long should it be, say you have an adventure, it starts in the daytime or whatever, like morning time. How do you guys track, like, okay, at what point does it become, like, night or, like, something like, like how long does this time span you know. So you're talking about how to track the environment and the atmosphere around the players, or around the characters, not just the like, players. Just like how, you know, at what point do you, in your experience, think like, okay, it's night now? Or, you know, is it just like, do you have kind of set I do, I do time, distance, and actions. Okay. So, literally, a man can walk so many miles in an hour, right? Mm -hmm. So you can get that average and get to know it. You can only do so many things in an hour, too. A lot of things you want to ask players is, like, well, I want to search the room. Great. How long do you take time to do that? I take 10 minutes. Okay, what's everybody else doing for 10 minutes? Yeah. So eventually you're going to start building it in your head. The time is moving along, and when somebody asks you, you'll be able to throw something out pretty arbitrarily fast. And just remember, like I said earlier, whatever it is, be confident about what you say. If it takes two hours, it took two hours. Mm -hmm. That's... And just from then on, though, if they do that action again, you've already got the time. Well, you already done this before. You know, it takes two hours. It's going to take two hours again. Mm -hmm. And just keep doing that. Uh, I do very similar to him. I tell them, okay, you're starting today at this time. You've done this so far, and you've got to do this today. You know, and then I let them kind of take it from there. And depending on how long they take to get to whatever it is. But like, okay, cool. Now you arrive. It took you this long to get here. And I tell them that and they go, all right, we got that. And then, you know, whatever it is, once they start the thing, again, if they're zooming through it, you know, cool. You finish that whole, you know, you, you clear that dungeon in an hour. You get out, the sun is still up. Yeah. You know, but if they get in there and they're struggling with every single encounter, it's like, okay, it's gotten late. You know you've been in here for hours. The sun has to have gone down by now. Your bodies are tired. What do you do? You know, the thing is, is that the players themselves will start to dictate time because you may present them with something, doesn't matter what it is, uh, an object on an obelisk. And if they sit there and talk about it for 30 minutes in game session, has 30 minutes gone by? Yeah. Well, maybe it was an hour in game time. Yeah. So yeah, you can use that that as action mechanics too. Uh, I I have a I have a favorite trap. It's a puzzle trap. Um, I've used it countless times and it never fails. I've, and some of you have already heard this one, but it's the button. Uh, your your party appears in a room, and there are no obvious exits or entrances. They're just there. In the center of a room is a button, and then. Uh, there's like a voice that says in 10 minutes or in two hours, uh, the, you know, the end will come, you know, something very vague. And then there's like a visible timer for them to start counting down. And it's like, okay, well, do we push this button or not? You know, and it's like when they push the button, you know, the timer resets. Like, okay, cool. Well, without fail, Every single group that I have run the button on have taken at least a whole day in game trying to figure out how to get out of this room. And usually after about six hours, they're going, okay, wait, we need to figure out, you know, we got to eat, we've got to drink, you know, uh, we got time for a rest here. And they start figuring out, okay, but, you know, we've got to make sure somebody stays awake during the rest because somebody's got to hit that button to make sure that the end doesn't come. And eventually, without fail, everybody finally gets fed up and goes, I don't care anymore. I don't care. I don't want to do this anymore. Let the, let the end come. And it's like the clock reaches zero and a door slides open. And that's all there is to it. But they have just spent however long, you know, that they hit that button over and over again. 
I keep track of that and be like, okay, you come out and you know, it's been it's been hours. Or if you really want to mess with them, be like, you were in a pocket dimension. This is five minutes in the real world. <laughs> and I just you, you you get to kind of decide, and they get to kind of decide, uh, you know, how the time works. Um, make it make sense to the story. You know, uh, whatever is more compelling, uh, have it be that. So if they're going to a graveyard. I don't care how long, you know, I don't care if they left at the crack of dawn and it's on the other side of the city. I'm putting in enough stops along the way, things to pause them, trip them up. So that they're reaching that cemetery at dusk, you know, <laughs> because that's more compelling. You know, uh, again, um, you just, you're playing the pirate thing, right? Um, so even if it's storming and you can't see the sun, uh, there's got to be something, unless it's completely pitch black, uh, that's giving them some sort of idea of what time of day it is. Um, so what would you do? This is, a, I mean, this is how he's going to handle it. So like what time of day it is? Just yeah. Like stars. Full storm. Hurricane. Full storm. Yeah. No Complete cloud cover. They can't see stars. They can't see the ah. sun. <laughs> how do you handle it? How do you handle passage of time? I don't know. <laughs> I'll see. I didn't really give that much thought. Just kind of full storm. So I guess they would have to be able to tell, like, before the storm happened, how the sky looked. Because back then, people could look at the sky and tell the sun. Yeah, so but if like, there's full was, cloud cover. But it's full cloud cover, so they're just not going to know. Yeah. They're just going to have to ride out the storm until the storm's over. And then however long that storm lasted, they'll figure it out after that, I guess. Any suggestions from anybody else? Yeah. How would you handle it? So, or sometimes you can let the dice do the war work. Roll a d4, four hours past, three hours past. Sure, hours past. so that's a good way to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go for it. What'd you exactly say? One of the recommended ways to do it. Fill a bucket? Yeah, just fill a bucket with uh, rainwater and then uh, you know, keep doing that over and over and over and over. Every Roll time this ten, bucket fills. Ten buckets, so it's Whatever. There you go. <laughs> Look at that. He's, a, he's over here writing there. Good. Fill in buckets. Because that fits into the... Nice. So thank you. <laughs> See? Hey, look. You're in a room full of DMs. We've all got ideas. You don't have to try to go it alone here. Anybody else? How would you? Anybody else got any ideas? Throw them out. There's no, there's no bad ones. Uh, what if on the ship there's somebody whose job it is to ring the bell at every hour? Okay, it's yeah. three bells. That means you know, yeah, yeah we gotta we gotta do a, a crew switch out. Yeah, <laughs> but what happens if that person gets tossed overboard? Yeah, or, or the, the sand dial gets turned over. Yeah, the sand dial gets turned over, or uh, the storm is so bad, so furious, you can't hear the bells. Throw that in because that's all that all you've done is just add. You know, intrigue and, and you're, you're creating more compelling, uh, time can be a compelling thing. It's a, it's an element of the adventure. Um, and especially if you're on a time sensitive thing. Uh, and really, if, unless it's important to the story or it creates intrigue, I don't really worry too much about time. Uh, daytime, nighttime, you know, uh, but yeah, if it's, like I said, uh, the example of the cemetery, I want them to get there at dusk. Because that's going to be, they're going to be more nervous. They're going to be more intrigued. It's a little more danger, and you know this is a game. So if there's risk, you know that that kind of ups the the uh, it, the interest. You know, if there's no risk, then it's like, nah. You know, no matter what we do, it's going to be fine. If you go into the cemetery at midnight or noon, it doesn't change. Then you know, eh. Why are they here? What what are these heroes doing here? If anybody could just walk in here. Uh, uh, maybe there's stuff that happens at certain times too. Again, if it's important to the story or creates intrigue, that's that's how I would worry with that. Is that that answer the help? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, how have you been managing it? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, I mean, I've only run one game so far, but and it was kind of like a. I mean, we were doing this starter set, and mm -hmm. all we really got through because we can do it all in one go. All we really got through was fighting, like you know, you get off the ship as like the zombies, yep. mm -hmm. fighting them, getting to the town. You know, talking with some of the people, um, 
and they just took so long that that kind of filled up our right. real life day of playing. <laughs> well, so in that, mo in that module played. specifically, it'll actually it actually mentions how long it will take to go from like mm -hmm. um, shipwreck to the first adventure. It says it takes two and a half hours by boat, or it takes two or three hours to go by land. Mm -hmm. So you can you can go by that too. And that those kind of materials will teach you time mm -hmm. uh, using using pre pre created adventures because it also tells you that let's say they go by land they say well if it takes three hours they want you to throw in um, a, an encounter in. Mm -hmm. like uh, I believe it's specifically kobolds they get ambushed by kobolds yeah if they go by land and if they go by sea they there's no nothing hits them until they get to the cave itself. Yeah. So sometimes some pre-adventures will have some time in there for you to try to learn from. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, like I said in the beginning, I just use real time and distance to try to gauge. Yeah. You know, how long have my how long have they been doing something? What are their actions? Okay, they started at breakfast. Well, now it's eleven Z's because you did this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. so. uh, one thing for people who are creating their own homebrew world when it comes to daytime. Uh, how long is a day? Right. Is it uh, is it in Earth 24 hours, or is because this is on another realm? Uh, you know, are they on a 36 hour, 48 hour? Uh, keep that kind of stuff in mind. Throw some interesting things out. Even on our own planet Earth, there are places in the world that maybe they don't get a full 12 hours of daylight. Uh, or maybe they get, you know, seasons of daylight and then seasons of darkness. Uh, that could be something that you kind of work into your game or have that in, you know, again, part of the game as well. Uh, if it makes sense and it, again, builds that intrigue and gets people interested or, you know, uh, you're, you're coming up on the end of the, the rainy season or you're coming up on the end of or the beginning of the, the darkness season, you know, what kind of things happen and how long do they have until the next season? Uh, that's stuff that they can be like, okay, we've, we've only got a month longer of this, and then we're going to be okay. we just got to survive another month of this. Uh, or we've only got a month left, and then we got to be ready, you know, because then we've got six months of this. Whatever it is. But when you're building your homebrew world, keep that kind of stuff in mind. And whatever you say, write it down, document it, use it again. It'll probably get brought up again. Uh, all right? And randomly. And randomly, yeah. <laughs> Uh, wait, what season are we in right now? That was a yeah. good time. Yeah. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, I got a question. Go awesome. for it. Um, so my first time attempting to DM, it didn't work out so well. Um, it, the starter set had just come out, um, so it was like several years ago. Um, and uh, I had a player who was obsessed with the game. I mean, he, he had already he went and got the player's handbook that already read it. Yeah, or I had a PDF of it anyway. And, um, you know, he's way ahead of me in learning the game. Um, and so, like, I'm just, you know, I, I know what's in this little tab, little pamphlet here. That's all I know. And um, so the game fell apart because he would throw something in that I wasn't familiar with. And I think he was just a really smart, really passionate guy. But... It hurts me <laughs> because I, got you. I was like trying to play catch up to where he's at, you sure, know, sure. learning the stuff. Um, I didn't expect to have to know all the spells or, and, and all the stuff that he you did. Yeah, you don't. So in that situation, what would you guys? Do you have any tips that you would give? Absolutely. Yeah, I would. I would say, great. You're you're my rules lawyer. You're my encyclopedia. When right I have there. a question, I'm going to refer to you. And uh, so for like um, spells. If you have a character who's going to cast spells, just ask him to read the description of the spell out and then ask him, okay, what does that look like when your character casts it? That's a little bit of role playing too. Right. Uh, that just helps you out. Uh, again, uh, if they make an action you're not familiar with, I don't care what it is, dash, dodge, dip, duck, dive, dodge, duck, <laughs> have them read it out to you and say, okay, great, how are you implementing it in this situation? And it, it it becomes a back and forth. It still may not limit your frustration, 
but basically you're just going to have to try to learn how to just be a duck and let that water slide off your back and absorb it and and it sounds cliche but you're going to learn from it um so in that situation that's exactly what i do and that is exactly what i do do when i know i have a player who knows the rule book better than me i will flat out go what's the ruling on that yeah and then they'll sit there and describe it and and then sometimes i'll be checking simultaneously to see if they're not, you know not bending the rule for themselves uh, but yeah, no, use it, use it, you, the, and then they'll, they'll start to appreciate it. Most of them, will. some of them, you can't, you know, everybody. But. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I second that. I there is a guy um, that I like. He breaks down the types of players, and and he's the one that I talk about. Uh, you know, uh, he tells you there's two schools of thought on this. You know, the first one is there's cast, and then there's audience members. Well, then he says, or the other school of thought is, and he breaks down each character. He talks about the murder hobo. He talks about the mad scientist. He talks about the rules lawyer. And after he's identified each type of player, he tells you, this is how you make them happy without destroying your game. Mm -hmm. And that is his go-to. He said, you got a rules lawyer? You have the great tool right there and not tool in the way that you know you're currently thinking but tool as in i don't have to memorize this because i know there's somebody at the table who's already got this so i tell them right off the bat okay cool the dragon's gonna breathe a cone of cold uh what's the length on that breath weapon and what's the dc you know and they're gonna and you know what's happy what's good about that is i didn't have to memorize that there's somebody else at the table who's going to take the blame if it goes badly because they're the one who gave me the information. And that person just got validated because they got to do what their player type is, which is be the rules lawyer. It is an asset because it's helpful. That's something I don't have to keep track of. And as a DM, you are keeping track of an entire universe of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Let somebody else keep track of the mechanics. Yeah. How does that work if he's going to do this? Huh. Well, he could do A, B, and C, or D, E, and F. Cool. We're going to do that. You know, and just go from there. Uh, if they're challenging you, this is where I would get frustrated. Fully understand that. If you say, well, this happens, and they go, well, that's not how it works. It, it, would, it should work like this. We are playing in a game of make-believe and magic. Just because the rules are written this way, rules as written, does not necessarily mean that it's going to work that way every single time. Now that right there is your response back to them. They have now challenged you. You have rebutted them with literally quoting the DMG to them, mm -hmm. which this is not rules. These are guidelines to help you create. Yes. Most of these things will do this thing that you've just said. But this one is different. Now this person who's the rules lawyer is no longer thinking, well, the DM is running it wrong. Now they're going, well, I need that information because that's going to come up again. Why is this thing different? I'm no longer irked because I'm not challenged. I've just put it back on them. They now want to know everything there is to know about that creature. And I'm talking, you know, putting it in the back of my head, okay, i got to create something real quick about why this creature is this way and this work this way. You know, why this trap did this instead of what it's supposed to do. And I've got an improv, which we talk about. Improv is your biggest skill that you're going to go to. Write it down, take a note, because it's going to come back. Because if you've got a rules lawyer, if they're going to memorize that thing. Okay, so does this dragon spit a line of acid or is it a cloud of acid? You know, it's like, well, according to the rules, it's a line. But last time we encountered it, it was a cloud. So it could be a cloud. What does it look like? I mean, you're going to have to remember, okay, the last one had red spots on its tail. So, oh, yeah, this one's got red spots. The rules lawyer gets validation right then and there because they go, this one's going to have a cloud, you guys. And you move on. They're happy. You're happy. Everybody's moving on. You don't have people face palming because the rules lawyer has challenged and stopped the momentum of the game. We're moving on. So be happy when they're helping you, and when they challenge you, just throw it back to them that this is different because blah, and be ready to go from there. 
And if they still want to challenge you after that, be, just be like, I don't know what to tell you. That's how this is working this time. It's up to you to figure out why. You have to make it make sense now. I'm not going to try because I've already given you the reason. And just move on. Um, so I'm the DM, that's why. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> because I said so, it doesn't really work out very often. But in this case, yeah, so it does. <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah. All what right. Else? What else? As far as scheduling goes, um, is three hours every other week, is that too short of a time? I mean, I've seen varied answers online. For like Talk to your players time. what works best for them. Yeah. Um, I personally... I feel like once a week at four hour sessions is plenty of time. That gives you enough time to do an encounter in fifth edition, some puzzle stuff, some role play stuff, and you have enough time in between all of that that if you need to do breaks or dinner or vamp or whatever, you can do all of that. Uh, the shorter the time for the session, just on as the DM, you have to be a little more strict at the table about moving things along, keeping the momentum of the session, which I've talked about that before. For those of you who've been here, you know, before, momentum of the session, everything, once you start the game, you know, everybody, okay, everybody, we're in the world now, and this is what's going on. you got to keep that momentum going. Uh, again, this is a social game. So if you've only got three hours and everybody sits down and you get started and then somebody makes a movie reference and then for the next 30 minutes they are talking apart. about movies yeah. and it falls apart or they start talking about work or whatever. You know how you can use that to your advantage? So you're, you're, you're in a forest, you're in a dungeon, I don't care where you're at, and your players start talking back and forth about nonsensical stuff. <laughs> you can say roll a perception check or look at people's uh, passive perceptions or something and then just throw an, an encounter on them because they're sitting there arguing or talking, right? Well, the monster's next door, heard you. <laughs> <laughs> they're <laughs> hunting <laughs> someone or they're looking for something and they're yeah. making enough noise. You guys sound like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I had to do that last line of sound, though. It was like they just would not move and they just kept arguing over opening this door and then I just set them <laughs> so on the door. Was there, was there something on the other side of the door? Yes. Okay, they would have heard them. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So I they got like, the picture I had them themselves. Bust out and I even had them ones in the room bust out, so they got shit yeah. on it. And then I, was, I set the minis on the board while they're yeah. still talking. And then I go, roll for initiative. There you go. go. <laughs> <Ooh>. Exactly. <laughs> I'm uh, back on track. They're like, what just happened? In the old days, uh, Dragon Magazine and uh, Dungeon Magazine and uh, the RPGA Magazine used to have cartoons in them. And they would have little cartoons about that. It'd show a party <laughs> arguing outside the door. And then the monster opens up the door. They keep arguing. They don't see the monster. It's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. I tell my players that, like, while what you're saying in real life is not necessarily what your characters are saying, but the act of you talking is your characters speaking yeah. more. They're, so they're having a discussion not. about yes. something. They're yeah, because they're probably not walking in silence, yes. you know. There's very few so people do that. Yeah, so monsters will hear them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and on uh, on that note, too, um, when you're doing your session zero, make sure that you tell them, hey, guys, this is the expectation. We only have three hours. Let me use your example. I've got three hours. That's it. And I love all you guys. Love getting together and playing this game, but we've only got three hours. So we're going to have to keep, you know, the outside shattered down. If you guys want to go get coffee before this or pizza after this or whatever, cool. Remember that. Let's do that afterwards. We'll do waffles. Cool. Waffles. You know, but, uh, you know, we're here to, we're here, we're here because we all want to play this game too. So, you know, let's make sure we're playing the game. Now, some, it, it's unavoidable because if you're in this hobby, if you're in this game, you've probably seen or read something, heard something that made you go, I would like to do that as well. Okay, and so when it comes, that thing comes up, like, I want to swing on a rope and sword fight somebody. You've seen it in countless number of movies and TV shows, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. read it in books. When that thing happens, most likely that player is going to, or somebody at the table is going to go, oh, just like, blah, 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 and then there's going to be a conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to punish the players right away with that. I'm going to let them talk for a minute or two, and then I'll be like, okay, and next, you know, uh, as DM, you are the referee. You are the one who's 
uh, trying to make sure everybody's having a good time, including yourself. And uh, don't you, as the DM, get pulled into that as well, because you are probably got an opinion about whatever it is. Uh, you, you just got to keep it in mind. All right, all right, all right, all right. That's cool. That's fine. That's fine. All right, next, you know, and then, or this happens, or, you know, something. You've got to get everybody back into the game. So when it comes to, back to your original question, what's the appropriate timing on the session? It's up to you and your players, but set that expectation at session zero of we've only got this much time. So let's make sure that, love to have you guys in. If you guys want to come early and hang out and chat and cool, great. If you want to stay after, great. You know, for those who can do that, awesome. If you can only have this three hours available to you, then when you get here, like, let's make sure that we're on, you know, we're on task here. We're here, we're here to play games. So let's play the game. Um, and, and you just kind of, sometimes you do have to be a little firm about it, but I mean, that's your job. Uh, you took the seat, so you have to do that responsibility. Um, but there are ways to incorporate it into the game as we've discussed. So you are meeting, you said three hours approximately? Probably going to do three hours every other week. That's what we're looking so, at. Three to four. So, so yeah, okay. By week or every other week, we only get three hours. That means I'm going to try to pack in as much as possible into that three hours so that you guys will come back two weeks from now. Uh, <laughs> but let's make sure that when we're here, we're playing the game. We're getting right into it. Um, yeah, every other week, uh, that means twice a month. They're meeting for three hours, a total of six hours a month. That is that is not a lot of game time. So you got to pack every hour with some stuff. Uh, in that case, shopping trips, um, crafting, anything like that that's going to take time in the game, have it happen outside the session. Okay. Be like, okay, cool. Uh, so you guys are going to get to do some shopping, and you need to know this ahead of time. So uh, between now and the next session, you've got two weeks, do your shopping, and then when we come to play next time, be ready to go. You know, okay, you're going to do some crafting? Great. We're going to say that's happening between sessions. So, you know, if you've already got the item or whatever that you're going to craft, if it's like the beginning of the session and they're talking about that, like, okay, cool. Yes, you go ahead and write that item down on your sheet. You can go ahead and use it this session, but between sessions, we need to do a little role play and cover that so that we can actually, you know, this is how that happened during this time. And, but you need to go ahead and tell everybody else at the table, all right, so we were originally going to be starting on, you know, this day at this time, but because the wizard needs to craft a wand, you guys are pushed three days back. And now we're starting at this. You know, do that kind of stuff at the table so that the rest of the party knows, okay, for three days, the wizard is unavailable in doing this, so what's the rest of us doing? Um, but don't let them do that at the table. You know, just be like, cool, let's do that in DMs, let's do that in Discord, let's do it, whatever. Just, you know, we'll handle that between sessions. We got two weeks, you know, keep us interested, keep us going, and then when we come back, we'll continue on right where we left off. Do you have a Discord channel? Do all of you have a Discord channel? Nice. Yeah. Um, it work. Yeah. Um, I mean, mm, I, I use my group as a good example of this. Uh, so my group and I have been playing together for 17 years. We meet just about every Saturday. We're the same group of people, core group of people. We've had additions. We've had subtractions. But for the most part, it's been the same group of people. Um, 17 years ago, Discord did not exist. Uh Social media was in its infancy. Um, yeah, yeah, we were using message boards. Uh, uh, texting was a thing, but it wasn't like it is now. So yeah, you know, we were we'd be text messaging and stuff. Uh, I got a lot of stuff on AOL Instant Messenger and Yahoo Messenger. And, uh, that's that's gonna put a date on me, I guarantee you. Um, but yeah, that was the stuff we used to do uh, between sessions. Uh, if we weren't just meeting up and talking about it, you know, and, and inevitably that would happen too. Uh, people would show up at work and be like, "Okay, cool." So last week when we were doing this, I want to be doing this. You know, all right, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. We'd do that. Um, all right. Discord also has another valuable tool for your group besides communicating with one another. Inevitably, you're going to have a player who's I'm going on vacation. They're going to miss game day. Well, if they've got Discord on their phone or their tablet, 
you can this is <laughs> this is why I have the camera. Mm-hmm. So when somebody's missing out of my group, I set the camera up, it aims at the battle map, they can hear everybody talking around the table, and then they can communicate back to us. Yeah. And they can they can play remotely if if needed. I use it as it's there if it's needed, uh, mm-hmm. but we don't want anybody using it all the time, right? Yeah. But that's another value of Discord too. So you might have those days where somebody's like, oh, I'm going out of town. Mm-hmm. So you say, hey, can you play over Discord so the rest of us can meet and you're you're doing it too. And they'll be like, yeah, I'm just going to my grandma's house. Yeah, I can just sit in the, the living room and play. Yeah. So it could happen. So there, there are many ways to do that. Um, when it comes to scheduling, yeah, bear in mind that holidays happen, birthdays happen, work happens, life happens, and life is usually the reason why a session doesn't make. So make sure you, in session zero, look how I keep coming back to that. We set that expectation of if you cannot come physically, can you do this? Uh, you, you've got big family, you've got work, like, you know, as the DM, if the DM can't make it, the player should at least have a backup plan. Okay, well, if, you know, if, if uh, the DM's not here, then we're going to do board games, you know, because it's still a social thing. And I get cranky if I miss too many sessions because of one thing or another. And uh, I need my D&D. Like, yeah. You know, I've got to have it straight in the vein, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I make sure in session zero you're setting those expectations. Talk about the different things that are available. You know, if you can't make it, this is what we can do instead, or can you come online and do it that way? Uh, set it up for it at session zero so that when it happens, not if, but when it happens, you've already talked about it, you know what's going to happen, and you guys can continue the game. Because especially for yours, that's going to be a big one. You're meeting once every two weeks for three hours. If you miss a, a player, like how many players have you got? Uh, it's going to be five, possibly six. Okay. Right. okay, that's actually, that's good. If you miss a player, you've still got a majority of the party. You miss two players, you still got four, which is, for me, the ideal party. If you miss three, maybe we need to make see if any of those three that are missing can be here online so that we can play. Um, any more than that, then it's like, all right, so board games? <laughs> you know? Yeah, where are y'all playing? I will be playing at my house. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. My wife are trying to have a session together, and with the kids, we won't be able to do it anywhere else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. I understand. <laughs> Speaking as a parent who had children <laughs> that I couldn't bring with me to the game and play until midnight, uh, we also had to do that for a little while, where we were playing at home, and it, you know, um, what has ended up happening is now I've raised two nerds who also have their own D&D games <laughs> and and because they watched mom and dad do it and had a lot of fun and they kept wanting to be a part of it. And now they're old enough that they've got their own stuff going on. So, you know, introduce your kids to D&D. <laughs> My kids are obsessed with the cartoon. Yes. <laughs> very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, we got about three minutes. Anything else? Any other questions? Don't let the three minutes scare you. Everybody had excellent questions, yeah. points, ads. It was, it was great. Just one question I have is when you're running a predetermined module, yes. like Cursor Stride, Descent to Iron, whatever it may be, how do you, and of course, obviously, you do talk about during session zero, like, hey, we're running this module, but at the same time, how do you, like, stick to the module, but at the same time giving your players the player agency so they don't feel like they're going along for the railroad because you're playing a module that's already a pre-written story, the pre-written stuff, but you still want to make sure that they have their freedom. <laughs> so <laughs> if you get what that means, you want to give them the freedom, but you want to run the module at the same time. That's, so that's tough. Like, at that at that point, balance. Yeah, yeah, at that point you <laughs> really only have the choice of keep trying to push them towards the module somehow mm-hmm. some way come up with something or just let them go off and go with them yeah you may be oh. you may be <laughs> stepping into either another campaign you know have yeah, that ready yeah. okay they're 13th level so we're going to start here in this yeah. one for whatever mm-hmm. reason or, mm-hmm. or you may have to be ready to homebrew in a half a second mm-hmm. um, i will say that a majority of the adventures that are on the shelf right now the pre-written stuff have a if they do this, then yeah. this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Descent Avernus has that, like, 
if the party starts good and goes evil, this is now the adventure path, and it still follows pretty close. They still got to do a lot of the same things, but it ends with a different result. Um, Plus, there's a, a lot of in the built-in ones that yeah. also got like uh, random. They'll call random encounters. Yes. Yeah. So you can use those. So if they start to go off the path, you get a, you give them a random encounter, and especially in like uh, Stormwreck Storm Isle. Uh, if you're first level and you go off the rails and you run into an owl bear, you're definitely going back to Dragon Rest mm -hmm. because it'll tear them up. But you don't want to kill them, right? You just want to yeah, yeah. yeah. you want to make them want to tuck tail and run. Yeah. Railroading is its own yeah topic, and it's it's hard to get around because as a DM, again, you're not telling a story, right? You're playing a game, and the players are deciding how that game is going to be. Uh, yeah, they're the ones who make the story. You're just trying to fit the mechanics around what they're wanting to do. Uh, but if you're running one of these predetermined things, you have to kind of keep them on track a little bit. So that's where you're going to use that improv skill to guide them, kind of nudge them back towards it. I've been trying to give them, like, multiple options. Like, Curse of Straw has a thing. Like, if they're mm -hmm. this level, they need to be here, they need to be here, and there. I'm like, okay, well, that level, they can have the same level for here. So it's like trying to nudge them, like, are we going to the windmill? Are you going to the wine? Like, I mean, yeah. the same stuff. And that's, another, that's actually another well, Session uh, Zero type thing is yeah. if, you, if your players are telling you their expectations, some of them will say, I don't care, I'll, I'd like to play Curse of Straw, or mm -hmm. I want to play Descent of Avernus, yeah. or I want to play Candlekeep Mysteries, or so, whatever. And others will be just like I just want, I just want to roam the world, mm -hmm. so you're gonna to have to try to figure it out then, and, and then set the expectation of hey we're gonna run this this adventure. It's kind of railroady if you tell them right away. Yeah, maybe they'll be okay with it. Yeah, maybe they won't. You got to play it by ear. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, there is some niceness to that because you have borders to work within, you have structure, you have, you know, you can only do A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're one of those people when you're presented with too many options, like you just kind of shut down, yeah, railroad is nice because you're just like, I got three to choose from, I'm going to pick the one that makes the most sense for my character. Or the one that's going to be the most profitable for me. You know, you're going to pick whatever is self-serving, and that's going to be your choice. But you have A, B, and C to choose from. Um, yeah. All right. Um, all right. So I'm going to call it there. It's been wonderful, and we will do this again next. Oh, yes, we will do it again next month. Uh, I had to think because Pensacon uh, is the end of the month. Yeah. Uh, and, but that's that'll be over by Monday, so we're good. Um, so we'll still meet the last Tuesday of February. And we will continue working on, um, again, we were going to talk about the star set, but everybody was more interested in the yeah, homebrew. homebrew. So uh, awesome. if you like four, and those of you who are watching at home, want to come back next month and bring, like, some, just like some snippets or whatever of what has happened in the, ne in the le next month of playing, and you want to get like some feedback on it or you know get some information about like okay so what should we go what should we do now uh, how do i go from here uh, go ahead and bring that in uh, as you can see this is this is uh, this is your chance to meet with other people who've been where you're at know what you're going through and we want to help you <laughs> we yeah. want you to be happy be and have fun. Yeah. Yeah, have fun yeah all right so this has been your DM, Alex and Mark, once again, coming to you live from Comic Emporium. We are going to close it here. You guys have a safe and happy January, end of January, and we will see you all in February.